There's many important people are here tonight, not because they want to see me or any of the other speakers, but because Alyssa somehow got them to come. I don't know how she did it. No previous experience uh, organizing events. This was her very first, first one, is this. So I am, uh, I'm terrified. I'm terrified to think what she's going to do next year. So thank you, Alyssa, and also you're welcome because I gave you a great deal on my speaking fee and the deal was zero dollars and zero cents. <clears throat> we talked about it, we compromised, we negotiated, that's what we came up with. Um, I also wanna thank all of our other speakers tonight, uh, though I, do feel, I feel a certain resentment towards all of you. Um, I don't appreciate it when I'm the keynote and all the speeches before mine are really good and when you have two speeches before you that get standing ovations, it's a problem. Um, Abby Johnson in particular, I will never forgive you for this. That was like the best speech anyone's ever given in history. And this is a true story. We were in the green room before this. And Abby, you know this. I said to all the other speakers, please do not be too good. And Abby actually said to me, don't worry, mine sucks. Liar, you are a liar. Um, special acknowledgement is in order, and I wanna also add this, uh, as many people have, to Harrison Butker. Um, speaking, uh, speaking of me being outshined, uh, Harrison, Harrison just had to make national news and become the most famous man in America this week of all weeks. You couldn't wait till next week? We're doing the, uh, the, the meet and greet, um, and there's single file lines to meet all the speakers. And I'll admit, I kept looking over at his line, and I'm like, it's a lot longer than mine. It's a lot longer. But I'm also an introvert, so I'm kind of okay with it. Um, and Harrison, I want to say that, um, that not only, obviously, did Harrison have the right to speak and, and all of that kind of stuff, he was also right about everything he said which is very important to point out. Although we should also acknowledge that it's, it's highly controversial and provocative to suggest that it's good to get married, apparently. So Harrison, I, I don't hate you for your speech. Um, I hate you because you play for the Chiefs. <laughs> I'm a Ravens fan, so. Anyway, now that I've expressed all of my frustrations with every other speaker here, we can get on to the uh, topic. And it's a good segue into the topic tonight because the event is called Courage Under Fire. And um, I know what the event is called because I helped to come up with a title. And when I say I helped come up with it, my wife said to me, uh, what about Courage Under Fire? And I said, I like it, it's good. That's the creative collaboration that we do. I think that, um, in what way, I guess the question is, in what way are we under fire? I think I can assume that all of you in this room have a sense that you are under fire by the culture, under assault, and you're right, you are. We talk about the culture war, but the term is a little bit misleading, I think, because it brings to mind a pitched battle between two relatively equal forces meeting out on the battlefield. But that's not the type of battle that we're actually in. Um, if there ever was that sort of culture war, then that war has been fought already and we lost. Now, does that mean that all hope is gone? Does it mean that there's nothing for us to do now but curl up in the fetal position and give up? Obviously not. It simply means that the style of warfare has changed. In this culture war, we are guerrilla warriors. We're living in a conquered land, fighting against forces that conquered it. And it's a spiritual fight and it's an intellectual fight. And it's important to understand who exactly we're fighting against. So if we're, under a fi if we're under fire, who is firing at us? And what sort of fire is it? Well, on that point, I think we tend to use various names to describe the other side, um, our ideological opponents. The left, leftists, liberals, woke, libs. Um, there are a lot of other names we could use that we won't say here. Progressives. And maybe these terms historically have had slightly different meanings, but today they all mean essentially the same thing. And out of that buffet of options, I prefer progressive, and I prefer it because progressivism does in indeed progress. 
It's just that it progresses in the way that cancer progresses. It's not a progression towards something better or more, more whole or more functional, but rather more like the progression of a malignant tumor. And the ultimate goal of the progressive is to destroy all that once was, to empty everything of meaning, to pull the tree, the tree up by its roots, and to just throw it in the fire. Now, they aren't, they aren't building anything with the lumber, certainly not anything stable or enduring. All that matters to the progressive, the woke person, is the individual ego, the, the individual's desire. Everything in the world exists to service that. And whatever stands in the way of his immediate pleasure and satisfaction, or whatever he perceives to be standing in its way, must be annihilated. It must not exist. It has no right to exist. Now, there's no real vision beyond that. People ask me all the time, like, why are they doing all this? What's the plan? Well, there is no plan. You tear down the statues, you redefine the words, you bring the institutions crumbling down, sever the bonds of the family, and when that's done, keep doing it in an endless cycle of destruction. See, there, there is no step two to this plan. That is the plan. That's it. Now, what about us? Most of us in this room are Christians. And most of us, if we had to describe ourselves ideologically, we would probably call ourselves conservatives. Now, it's almost a cliche to ask this question now, but the question is still a good one, which is, what are we conserving exactly? Well, we're tasked with conserving all that is under attack, history, tradition, the family, liberty, Western civilization itself. And underneath all of that is something even more fundamental, the most fundamental thing of all, which is truth. Our first and foremost job right now is to fight for, defend, and promote truth. Because truth itself is under attack in a way that it has never been before in the history of humanity. There is a war being waged on reality, and that is where we need to be primarily engaged. See, we're, we're, we are arguing not just for propositions that happen to be true, but for truth as a concept, for the truth itself, for the very existence of truth. Because the people on the other side not only promote untrue ideas and make untrue claims about the world, but they also deny that anything such as truth exists. We all get our own truth, they say. And so every objective truth claim is automatically false, except the claim that there is no truth. That is somehow still true. Now, so it is truth that's under attack, truth itself, and we, we have to understand this. But I think sometimes we lose sight of it. You, you'll often hear and, and maybe have often said that um, one of the biggest problems in our culture is that we're, uh, it's a culture very hostile to, to free speech, that there's an assault on free speech. And you look at all the ways that speech is stifled by big tech on social media, on college campuses. You look at how people are canceled and harassed and doxxed and fired for their speech. And this is proof, supposedly, that we live in a society that rejects free speech, that the powers that be do not want us to openly express ourselves and promote our beliefs and argue in favor of our, our ideas and our opinions. That's the claim. And indeed, it's an, it is an accurate assessment for the most part. This attempt to undermine free speech is a, is a major problem, but it's not the main problem. The main problem is not that people suffer these consequences for expressing ideas, generally speaking, is that they suffer these consequences for expressing true ideas. Now, there have been a lot of, lots of societies throughout history that, you know, have put restrictions on the kinds of ideas you can express publicly, and we can argue about whether that's a good idea or not to do that, but what sets us apart is that the disfavored ideas, the ones that are even sometimes banned and censored, are true, and they are banned and censored and disfavored precisely because they are true. You know, idea like men are men and women are women, that is, that is a statement met with this sort of hostility. It's a statement that you can't even say out loud on a lot of the biggest uh, platforms that control dialogue in this country. The reason why it's so Orwellian and oppressive to ban or censor people for saying these things is not simply that people should be free to express themselves, but even more so that people should be free to say what is true, and they are not. 
Now, it's the same thing on college campuses and in, and in the school system generally. You know, it's often lamented that conservative students and speakers are protested, harassed, uh, often shut down entirely. And it's lamented on the grounds that this kind of response violates the principles of free expression. You know, they say it's a shame that there isn't a, a more healthy and robust debate in the university system. And they decry the fact that so many college students and uh, more importantly, college administrators are so hostile to opposing ideas. And I know a little bit about this, of course. That last year I was on a college tour uh, giving talks centered around gender ideology and my film, What is a Woman? And everywhere we went, angry mobs took to the streets and they were screaming and they were crying and carrying on. There was one campus where someone started, uh, uh, in protest, started ripping out pages of the Bible and eating them. Now, on the bright side, it was probably the first low-calorie meal this person had had in a long time, but by the looks of it. At another, they, they pulled the fire alarm multiple times uh, during my speech. At another one, they dumped marbles in the, in the hallway so we'd trip. The counter-protest was organized by the, I don't know, the Looney Tunes or something. I expected an anvil would fall out of the sky. But what made this reaction so pathetic and disturbing? Is it, is it that they were trying to stop me from expressing myself? Is that what it was? Is it that they were lashing out because, uh, at me because I have an opposing idea? Well, yes, but the really troubling detail is what specific opposing idea they were lashing out against. What exactly they were trying to stop me from expressing. I was there to defend the proposition that biological sex exists and that women exist and that men exist, and that only women can have babies. That was, the whole, that, that was the whole speech. So that is the particular opposing idea. It was a short speech. It was five minutes long. Um, that is the particular opposing idea that sent them into these demonic fits of rage. And so that's what makes it so alarming. Not that they're shutting down free speech, but that they're shutting down the most fundamental truths of life. So the war on truth, on reality, is what lies at the foundation <clears throat> of every major battle in the culture war. And we could go down the list, the Holocaust of the unborn through abortion, the destruction of marriage through the codification of quote unquote gay marriage, which is a thing that can't really exist, the war on the family, the attempt to subvert the nuclear family, make it irrelevant through barbaric practices like commercial surrogacy, the multi-billion dollar pornography industry, which seeks to corrupt our minds and souls, and more importantly, the minds and souls of our children. Gender ideology, the claim that our very biological nature is up to us to determine. Now, these are all, at bottom, efforts to destroy that which cannot be destroyed, which is the truth. This is one of the reasons why gender ideology has been a special focus of mine as of late. Because the untruth at the core of this thing of the transgender phenomenon reaches down to the, to the, to the deepest conceivable level. So gender ideology wages its assault not just against knowledge, but against our knowledge of ourselves. A person fully enthralled to this lunacy has lost grip on not just reality in general, but on the reality of himself. Transgenderism doesn't simply replace one notion of the self with some other newer notion. Rather, it replaces one notion of the self with no notion at all. And that's the whole reason why the gender ideologue cannot answer the what is a woman question. He doesn't have an answer. It's because he seeks to replace what is definable and knowable with a hazy, indecipherable mess of contradictions and, and falsehoods. He replaces light with darkness and soon gets lost in it himself and will probably eventually succumb to despair and in a large percentage of cases, suicide. And the reason why you have this suicide epidemic among uh, trans-identified people, it's not because they're bullied, as we're often told. It's because they are living in a state of perpetual self-rejection. And nobody can be happy in such a state. But this is the case for all of these different assaults on truth. The people waging the assault seek to redefine by getting rid of one definition and replacing it with nothing. 
You know, they tell us that an unborn child isn't a human being. Okay, well then what is an unborn child if not a human being? What is a human being? They can't say. They tell us that marriage is not a union between a man and a woman. Okay, well then, what is it? They cannot say. They say that a woman is not an adult human female. Okay, then what is a woman? Quite famously, they cannot say. There is no replacement. There is only destruction of what was real and true and coherent so that in its place, they can install falsehood and fantasy and incoherence. The war on truth is what lies underneath every cultural battle, but there's something underneath that as well. Because the war on truth is ultimately the same eternal struggle that began in the Garden of Eden. You know, the war on truth is a war on God. Those waging these assaults intend to storm the gates of heaven and pull God down from his throne so that they can sit in his place. They can't do it, that's what they want to do. They despise truth, they oppose it because it represents power that they don't possess. It's something that they have to humble themselves before and they cannot humble themselves. The truth is something that is our obligation to affirm. And yet, they don't want to affirm anything. What do they say? They say, affirm me. I'm the one who should be affirmed. And so they declare themselves gods, lords of all creation. They get to decide who a person is and who a person isn't. They get to decide what a marriage is and what it isn't. They get to decide even and especially what their own bio biological makeup is. They want to tear down what was made in his image and rebuild it in their own. But theirs is an image of despair and confusion, and so that's all that they put in its place. So what can we do about it? What should our answer be in the face of all this? Um, I'll, I'll offer two very simple answers. Far from an exhaustive list, but it's a good place to start. Um, and it's simple. It's a simple solution. If you want complex, nuanced solutions, then I'm the wrong guy for that. The first thing is that we must stand with the truth and speak it always, no matter what, and for its own sake. You know, we've gotten to this point in our culture where millions have become confused about the most basic realities of life and human existence. We've gotten here because millions who are not confused, who know the truth, have been too afraid to speak it as loudly and consistently as they should, as we need them to. You know, when we were filming What is a Woman, I'll never forget traveling from city to city uh, to do our Man on the Street interviews. And being told again and again by the random passers-by that we stopped that they wouldn't talk about the subject on camera. Or they would talk, and then they found out what the subject was, and they ran away. And what was the subject? The subject was the definition of a woman, the reality of human biology. And they wouldn't talk about it. They were terrified to talk about it. And, and I get it, you know, they're worried about their jobs, they're worried about being canceled, they're worried about social alienation. I understand being worried about those things. But courage is not the absence of fear, courage is being afraid and then acting in spite of it. And we are called to courage in these times. Not very much courage, really not a lot, actually. Nobody's being asked to risk their lives at this point. I mean, we are all sitting here in this uh, wonderful event and having a great time. But it's actually not a lot of courage that we need. Shame on us all the more for failing to show it. We just need enough courage, just enough, to speak the truth and then just let the chips fall where they may. To stand up and say, here's what's right and then let the consequences come, whatever they are. Now, I get questions all the time from people who say, well, you know, what, what do I do? How do I, 
You know, they, they want me to go along with the pronoun thing. They want me to go along with this and that. And, but what, what happens if I do and then I get in trouble with my job or I have a family member who's going to hate me now? And I get these questions all the time and, and, you know, the real answer is, well, then you might get in trouble with your job. And you might have a family member who hates you now. I don't, that's, it might just, that might be what happens. But every moral outrage in our culture, every atrocity, every place where the agents of confusion and despair have prevailed, they've only prevailed through the silence of those who are too afraid to oppose them. I mean, that, that's why we have 60 million dead babies through abortion. That's why the institution of marriage is destroyed. That's why we have unspeakable atrocities like children being castrated and butchered by mad scientists masquerading as doctors. It's why we have the farce of women competing against, or rather men competing against women in women's sports, while the fathers of those girls who are being robbed and taken advantage of very often sit by silently, emasculated, allowing the travesty to continue. Now, the people pushing this agenda, they, they don't need us to believe what they're saying. They don't care about that. You can have your own thoughts and beliefs in your own little head. They don't care about that. They only need you to cooperate. They demand tolerance, and then they demand acceptance, and then affirmation, and finally celebration. But at no point do you actually have to actually believe it. They don't care about that. You don't have to believe it. They can't force you to believe anything. In fact, I think they kind of prefer it if you don't believe it, and yet you do what they say anyway, because there's a lot of power in that. They can only scare you into conforming whether you believe it or not. So speak the truth, defend it, defend it explicitly. I know it sounds really, really simple, but so many of the problems in our culture would start to go away overnight if every person who knew what was right would just say so. Now, second, we have to form families and have children and raise them in the faith and equip them to be warriors for truth. And this is by far and away the most important thing we can do in this fight. Uh, there's not one single other action we can take that will have a greater impact than this. It is, after all, a generational struggle that we're engaged in. It took generations for us to reach this point as a culture. It'll take generations to get out. Which means that if our society is ever going to be again grounded in a basic recognition of truth and Christian morality and human dignity, that victory will not be achieved in our lifetimes. We will not live to see it. Now, maybe our children will if we, if we properly train them to carry on the fight. Maybe their children or theirs. And you know, the idea that this degenerate, truth-hating culture is destined to persist for many more decades may sound grim. It may sound like a pessimistic forecast, but I, I don't intend it that way, and I don't see it that way. In fact, there's something clarifying about it, almost freeing. Because, well, we know what our job is. It's our job to fight. That is our lot. That's why we're here. It falls to us and nobody else. And, and we should carry as much of the burden as we possibly can and delight in that burden because it means that there's less for our children to carry for us in the future. Now, fortunately, we can, we can see this work in real time. Uh, in fact, I would guess, I would guess that if we went back to those same cities where we filmed before and we asked uh, people the same questions, now, two, three years later, we would probably get many more people who are willing to stop and speak basic truths about human biology on camera. I think we would now today. Because people are becoming bolder on this topic. And we've won many smaller victories in the fight against trans ideology and now the trans ideologues are in retreat. They are less powerful today than they were three years ago. And I pray that by the time my children are adults, that this is one form of madness that they won't have to contend with. Because 
we will have done the hard thing and contended with it for them. I rejoice in the idea that maybe I have the privilege to endure certain lumps and bruises so that my kids don't have to. I pray that that's the case. But we know, of course, that the final victory uh, will not be won in this life. What we call our culture war is just one manifestation of the cosmic war for the souls of all mankind. And the good news is that we've read the last page of the book and we know how that war ends. And if we're faithful and if we stand by the truth, then in the end we will rest in the truth and it will be our home for all eternity. That is our hope and it's more than enough to keep us going and point it always in the right direction. Thank you.